my lords and members of the House of Commons, by virtue of His Majesty's commission under the great seal to us and other lords directed and now read, we do in His Majesty's name and in obedience to His Majesty's commands prorogue this Parliament to Tuesday, the third day of July, 1945, to be then here holden. Today at the House of Lords, the Lord Chancellor, after reading the King's speech, announced the dissolution of Parliament. Great Britain is faced with a new general election. Britain is divided into 640 parliamentary constituencies. It is probable that no one of these is exactly typical, but we must tell our story in terms of one of them, and so we settled upon the division of Kettering in the county of Northamptonshire. The division covers an area of some 130,000 acres and has a population of 74,000 people. There are those who work in heavy industries, such as in the manufacture of iron and steel, while others are in the boot and shoe industry. Some are occupied in agriculture, while a great number are small traders in towns and villages. They have the choice of three candidates with three different political creeds. One candidate is Councillor John Dempsey, a local figure who represents an independent doctrine of his own and is standing as independent Christian. Mr. G. R. Mitchison, a barrister at law in private life, has been adopted by the Labour Party as their candidate. The third is Lieutenant Colonel John Profumo, who represented Kettering in the Parliament just dissolved and is standing again as Conservative. Centre of all the division's election activities is the market town of Kettering itself, where each candidate has his headquarters and his agent, the impresario who organises the whole campaign. It is the agent's job to arrange meetings, book halls, supervise printing of posters and leaflets, fix transport, answer queries, and deal with last-minute breakdown of plans. His first step before any public meetings begin is to arrange for the candidate to address small local committees of supporters who will be helping him with the campaign. And in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I should like to assure Colonel Profumo of very solid support at Cranford. I will now ask him to address you. Frederick Robinson, ladies and gentlemen, this evening I've come to tell you something about this general election campaign and also, what I want to ask you to do for me. I've got three opponents to fight at this election. The first and most dangerous one is apathy. And the others are the other two candidates. Now, I want to ask you to deal with the apathy and leave the other two candidates for me to deal with. Meanwhile, the Labour candidate's agent is arranging committee meetings for his organisers and supporters, who are going to help Mr. Mitchison to win his votes. So the issues are really nothing less than the future of this country and whether we can have a lasting peace in the world. It matters enormously, this election. You see, you've got to do something too. You've got to canvas particularly. So you have to canvas every street and every ward and every village. I know it's not going to be easy in the time, but we've got to get everyone out on polling day. Mr Chairman, how to have meetings outside the factories? Because that is very important if we wish to get our message across. Yes, certainly. Councillor Dempsey, being an independent candidate without the resources of a nationwide political party to back him, has his own daughter to act as his agent. The first important event in the election is nomination day. This is the day on which each candidate comes to see the chief election official, the returning officer, who in this case is the town clerk. The nomination day formalities are only a part of the returning officer's job. His function carries many responsibilities and he remains entirely non-party throughout the whole election proceedings. Each candidate brings with him his nomination papers with the names of a proposer, a seconder, and eight assentors. He also has to deposit 150 pounds in currency to show that he is of good faith in standing for Parliament. If he polls less than one-eighth of the total votes, he will forfeit this deposit. During the campaign, the candidate and his agent work very closely together, meeting at least twice a day to discuss their plan of action. 
Meanwhile, the voluntary workers, recruited by the agent and his organisers, get on with the work of addressing envelopes and sending off circulars, notices of meetings and copies of the candidate's election address. Election addresses are sent to every person entitled to a vote, and each candidate is allowed one free postage for every voter in the constituency. The election address gives a broad outline of each candidate's policy and bears his photograph, so that every man and woman who receives it will know what the candidate stands for and what he looks like. At the time of this election, Britain had a large number of her voting public in the forces overseas. As their vote will carry considerable weight in the final results, Copies of each candidate's election address and a ballot paper to vote on are dispatched under supervision of the returning officer to members of the forces all over the world so that the soldier in Malta or even the Burma jungle can vote for his home candidate. At election time, an extra load is thrown onto the staff of the postal service, which serves as a link between the candidates and those members of the public whose business or household duties prevent them from attending candidates' meetings. So in this way, Mrs. Green, the busy housewife, receives her copies of the election addresses. As part of their visionary policy, the candidates take an interest in the youth of their constituency. Although these youngsters are not yet entitled to vote, they'll be tomorrow's party supporters. And in the meantime, they want to learn what politics are all about, ready for when they have a say in the government of their country. During the days before polling day, candidates make personal contact with the voting public all over the division. They go out to the men who work on farms and in the fields. They tour the workshops of local industry and contact as many people as they can individually. For only by getting to know them individually can the candidate learn the needs, hopes and fears of the people he will have to represent if he wins the election. He must also gain a full understanding of their various problems so that he can fight their battles, while at the same time the opportunity of discussing both big national issues and more personal problems man to man helps the individual voter to gain confidence in him. In the meantime, the agents rally every possible supporter to back up the candidate's personal efforts by house-to-house -house canvassing. Candidates themselves spend their evenings addressing meetings in towns and villages all over the division. People are becoming addled by party slogans and by catchphrases which are being talked of on the radio and mentioned in all the newspapers. I believe in being governed, but not in being spoon-fed and kicked and patted and cursed and praised and directed and fined and licensed and exhorted all the time. So, if it's houses you're after, I don't promise them tomorrow. No one can do that. But far the quickest way you'll get them will be on the lines I've been talking about just now. And they come first and foremost in the Labour programme. And I'm not claiming that I'm superior because I'm standing as a Christian candidate. I say I need Christianity so badly and Jesus Christ myself. And I know all you do. And I know the world does. Mr. Dempsey, don't you think there is good a Christians in the labor movement as you are yourself? Possibly, but when Mr. L when Mr. Lansbury was turned down at the Labour conference, I forget the year, as a whining old Christian, I knew I'd got into the wrong party. Morning, Warner. Morning. 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 How did you get that off straight away? Well, how did you get on at Corby last night? Excellent. Very pleased indeed. The uh, issue about nationalisation is growing, but there seems to be a lot of personal support. How many meetings have we got tonight? Five. Five? Cripping, that's a lot. Where are they? Lambrook, Wall Green, Thornley, Cold Ashby, Aldrin Green. 6.30. First meeting, and don't be late. I'll be there. Ladies and gentlemen of the Landport, here comes the National Conservative candidate, Colonel John Profumo. Here he comes into the field. Now, Landport, don't forget, this is your candidate, and we hope your future member. Here he comes. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Every day between now and polling day on July the 5th, I am coming round the villages of my constituency in order that I may take my political views to the men and women whom I know are very busy in their ordinary everyday jobs. I am standing once again as a conservative candidate in support of the formation of a national government. The press plays a very important part in the campaign. 
During election time, the local newspaper sends out reporters to get interviews with all the candidates. Through the press, a great many people can be reached who may not be able to get to meetings. In a town like Kettering, which is only one daily newspaper, editorial policy aims at being politically impartial and endeavours to give completely unbiased presentation of election news. In England, the freedom of the press holds good. There is no question of censorship or interference from outside. draws near and the wheels of the electioneering machinery turn faster as everyone concerned throws more and more effort into the campaign. Everything possible is done by each candidate to catch the eyes and the ears of the voting public. It is a struggle to attract, to impress, above all to convince that here is the man against whose name they must put a cross on polling day. But the British public are individuals. They watch and listen but they think for themselves. Already everyone is talking politics and almost everyone is taking part in the campaign. Windows of supporters become display mediums for their candidates, trees become billboards, and the ordinary business of the day is coloured with discussions on political viewpoints. In fact, every thinking person in the British Isles looks on his country's problems as his own responsibility. And, of course, he tells his friends what he would do if he were Prime Minister. Last, it is polling day. Mrs. Green has done a lot of thinking in the last few weeks, and now her mind is made up. Inside the polling station, she gives her name to the polling clerk, who checks it off the voters' register. This contains the name and address of every person in the constituency who is entitled to a vote, and is a safeguard against any person trying to vote more than once. The presiding officer issues the ballot paper bearing the names of the three candidates. The ballot paper is stamped with a special seal, the design of which is secret until polling day, preventing anyone printing a few extra ballot papers on their own. Mrs. Green takes the ballot paper into a screened partition where, free from observation, she puts a cross against the name of her selected candidate. The folded ballot paper is then put into the ballot box in front of the presiding officer. polling day, candidates make a tour of the constituency. There are polling booths all over the division, and a final visit by the candidate to rally his supporters can mean a few extra votes, which may be for him the deciding factor. p.m. The limit of the extension to polling hours. The voting which has gone on since 8 o'clock in the morning must now stop. The people have had their last chance to vote and the doors are locked. The ballot boxes containing the country's verdict are sealed up until the day of the count. From each polling station in the division, the sealed ballot boxes are transported under careful supervision to the main police station in Kettering where they are stored in the cells for safekeeping. Meanwhile, the forces overseas have received their election addresses and ballot papers, rightly concerned about the kind of government they think will do most for their country in the difficult years that lie ahead. They have their voice in the matter. They have their vote. Normally, the count takes place the day after polling day. But in this election, it is held up until the forces' ballot papers have been flown back from the various fronts. <laughs> On the
On the day of the count, the seals on the ballot boxes are broken. The boxes are unlocked and the ballot papers are tipped out onto long tables for counting. The count takes place in the main hall of a large school in Kettering, central town of the division. The clerks who do this job are civil servants who have been released from their ordinary work and are paid specially for their services on this day. But the watchers who stand behind them are voluntary members of the general public. Each candidate may appoint 20 of these voluntary scrutineers to see that the counting is correctly carried out. The votes for each candidate are counted into blocks of 50. The blocks are then carried to tables where each candidate's votes are laid out ready for the final count. Meanwhile, outside the building, the crowds are gathering, eager to hear the result. Before the final figures are announced, the returning officer checks the badly recorded votes with the candidates, who mutually agree which shall be counted and which shall be declared void. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to announce the result of the poll for the Kettering Division the parliamentary county of Northampton with the silk of Peterborough. The voting is as follows. John Chamberlain Dempsey, 2,381 votes. Gilbert Richard Mitchison, 29,868 votes. And John Dennis Profumo, 23,424 votes. And I therefore declare Gilbert Richard Mitchison, duly elected Member of Parliament for the Kettering Division. It's my very great pleasure to move a vote of thanks to Mr. Chaston and his staff. But before I come to that, I want First of all, to say one or two other words. First... Well, it may not be what everybody wanted, but it's what the majority want. And the man who has won the most votes will represent the division of Kettering in the new parliament. Very soon, the new member for Kettering enters the House of Commons for the first time, when he goes to take the oath before the Speaker. And from that day, he becomes a paid member of the legislature. Finally, the King opens the new Parliament and Britain settles down to solve her current problems under the leadership of a new government chosen freely by her people.